On the eve of Youth Day commemorations, we speak to Musi Maimane about the future of South Africa and whether leaders like him have realistic ideas to turn South Africa around. Good evening, my name is Sizwe Mbofu Walsh and welcome to another episode of Unfiltered. Forced to retire as leader of South Africa's main opposition party, Musi Maimane is once again calling voters to join his newfound vision. But why should South Africans trust him after hopping from one political party to another, leaving many confused about his politics. Tonight we ask, can Musi Maimane's leadership be trusted? Please do join the discussion using our Twitter handle at UnfilteredSABC and the hashtag MaimaneOnUnfiltered. Before we embark on the conversation, let's take a look at this brief scene setter. Musi Maimani burst onto South Africa's political scene in 2011 as the Democratic Alliance's mayoral candidate for Johannesburg. Confident and aspirational, Maimani was the new kid on the block. He defeated contender Vasco da Gama in a race to become the DA's mayoral candidate for Johannesburg. I realize that the South Africans who are living here are South Africans from all walks of life. They are black, they are white, they are Indian, they are colored. Go to us in Songke Apa, Sia Pambili, Amansha! His then party didn't win the polls to govern Johannesburg, but Maimane continued to rally voters to support the DA's vision. His rise to leader of South Africa's main opposition party in 2015 was seen as nothing short of meteoric. Touted as the fresh face that would complement the DA's brand of the so-called inclusive change, Maimani was seen as the black face that would turn the fortunes of the traditionally white DA, which struggled to beat the juggernaut that was the ANC and winning the black vote. Dubbed the Barack Obama of South African politics, observers say as the leader of an opposition party in parliament, he managed to hide his incompetence behind the fight against Jacob Zuma when he denounced rampant corruption, the lack of accountability and the disintegrating governance within the state. Despite garnering more black voters, a section of black voters still saw him as nothing more than a puppet dancing to the tune of his party's white masters my question more specifically is that why mr. president it's clear to me that there's a contradiction between what in fact happened and what you said I want to understand why did you deliberately mislead the National Council of Provinces and violate the very law you signed into law clearly there's a blatant contradiction and I'd like to know why you willfully misled the people of this country. Thank you very much. Four years after ascending the party's highest position, Maimani sang a different tune as he relinquished his leadership of the party in October 2019. Although the party made important gains in 2016 after taking over an additional three of the country's metros in coalition agreements, the DA's fortunes were reversed in the 2019 elections. His indecisiveness, conflicting views on policy questions and inconsistent approach towards resolving internal party matters led to his demise. And in the end, we've come to the conclusion that despite my best efforts, perhaps the DA is not the best vehicle which is suited to take forward the vision of building one South Africa. And therefore, it is with great sadness that in order to continue this fight for the vision I strongly believe and the country I so dearly love, I will today step down as leader of the DA. But I am here to tell you, come 2024, a new South Africa is coming. 
My Money re-emerged as he launched what he called a new movement, Build One South Africa, or BOSA, which in 2022 morphed into a political party ready to contest the 2024 national elections. Once again, he is rallying South Africans behind his new vision of what he calls citizen-led leadership with Ubuntu at its core, and it is promising to honor the past. Some have dubbed this the latest in an effort to grab power and the question why he should be believed after being the face of a political party that refuses to acknowledge the impact of apartheid on today's inequalities among other things and fails to condemn Israel's atrocities and its occupation of Palestine. Does Musi Maimani represent hope in South African politics or is he a failed politician who cannot be trusted with power? given his past endorsement of a party that is colorblind to South Africa's complex history. Jacqueline Mapala for Unfiltered. Welcome back. Mr. Maimane, thank you so much for joining us on Unfiltered. No, thank you so much for having me. It's always good to have another Liverpool fan uh, across the table. <laughs> Absolutely. We never walk alone. <laughs> We're holding our heads in shame this season, but... Uh, on to more serious matters, uh, you said that you could be one of four people in a recent interview that could be president of South Africa. Yeah. You said it could be President Ramaphosa, if he's still around, John Steenhuisen, Julius Malema, yeah. or you. Absolutely. Can you expand on that? Well, first and foremost, I, I want to sort of come back strongly into politics because I've got a strong vision for where this country needs to go. And I've known both victory and I've known defeat. And so I come in now with a fresh set of eyes looking to say, where can South Africa go? Now, next year's elections are a very significant election in our country. And this, the candidates you've highlighted, both in President Ramaphosa, have shown the fact that he's led this country to where its economic demise is at now. Julius Malema has hit his own points in terms of where the EFF is at. I think the DA represents a particular minority view. And I'm coming in there to say, let's expand a vision of all South Africans. And I am building an organization that ultimately I believe that will garner a sufficient amount of votes to be one of the four presidential candidates to be considered next year. Well, let's leave aside Malema, Stian Hazen and, okay. and Ramaphosa. Bosa is not yet registering anywhere close in the polls to those three major parties. So aren't there also candidates who are even in front of you of that queue from Mr. Mashaba to Mr. McKenzie, maybe to even new entrants like Mr. Zibi? Why would you be the logical next person after the big three, as it were? Well, first and foremost, it depends. When you talk about polling, let me attend to that question. People follow people. And that's been... And that's an important issue about democracy. We need to be able to, in a country where institutions have been weakened, leadership and people are going to matter. When you look at that particular poll, of the most popular leader in the country is probably be Mr. Ramaphosa ahead of me. And then, then it's between myself and Mr. Malema and Helen Ziller. None of the others feature in that, in that, in that category. So I am staking the fact that given the vision, given the vehicle that is BOSA and the values I share, we will be able to amass that journey going forward. So I don't look at where parties sit. I look at where those particular individuals sit as a question. And, and you, you are correct about that, but people ultimately aren't voting in a direct presidential election. It, it will be about yeah, yeah. the parties. And so BOSA is not polling at, say, 9 or 10. It's, it's not even registering around the one mark, or it's, it's, it's part of the other category at the moment. No, so no, it's hard to know I think, where... I think, let's Hold be on. clear. Let, let, me, let me finish yeah. the question. Sure. So, so the question is, with Bosa polling where it is at the moment, would it be credible to say that you could be the person to lead the country when we've already had people criticizing the situation in Joburg with people coming from a low party base mm -hmm. into high, high no. uh, governmental office? I, th I think we can discuss the coalitions and cities in a moment, but let me come back to this question that you put. When I say people follow people, 
In 2019, I know very well that there were many citizens who went to the polls and said, I want to give Mr. Ramaphosa a strong mandate. So they voted for him, gave, giving the NC an increased number. I can't imagine the EFF without Mr. Malema. Let's be fair. Take him out the place, then what is left? The DA has a different problem, and I think it will see what happens when either people accept or reject Mr. Stiernason. So it matters, the individual. I am polling high enough. And when South Africans were asked the question uh, in a recent poll that we did, if Mr. Maimani get, got back into politics with his own party, how many of you would vote for him? And 12% said definitely, and 24% said we think about it. Therefore, already there's 12% of citizens who are coming in saying definitely want to vote. We are building BOSA, and in the last six months since the launch of the 24th of September, we have branched out in all nine provinces. We've got structures in all nine. We've got leadership that is there that's already working. We've gone out, and this is the endorsement that we seek. When I take a unique model of recruiting candidates for elections, 450 P South Africans who have to produce 1,000 signatures have already applied. We will train them, whittle them down to 200 for national and 200 for provincial. We have shown a membership base now, an activist base, because we want to build an army of 100,000 people by November. We had about 20,000 or just below that now. So South Africans are coming on board. And lastly, we've articulated a vision that focuses on saying, if we want to build one South Africa, here are the 10 policy spaces that we want to focus on, 10-point plan that says, how do we keep the lights on? How do we put a job in every home? How do we keep citizens safe? How do we improve education? How do we deal with health care? And ultimately, how do we empower citizens to be digital participants? And we are going to get on to the policy. Fair. The policy but proposals. what I'm trying to articulate to you is that this is not a fly-by-night. It's not a, just a startup that just came from anywhere. We've been working since 2019 in communities. And you'll recall that even in 2021, I went and worked with candidates all across the country in their communities and said to them, can we practice direct election? Can we show that it actually works? No, th there's no doubt about that. So, so, and I'm not calling it a fly-by-night So I want to dismiss the idea. But, but, but what I am saying is, are you worried that your personal popularity may not translate into Borsa's popularity and that maybe in the thick of all the new entrants, Borsa may be lost, even though people do, some people do like you as a person, many others like other political leaders. Well, that's the, but the, translating the sure, like, sure. those who, who do like you, translating that into a political victory in an election is, is a different ballgame. Yeah, and that's the work of what campaigns do, actually. So we're working hard every single day, communicating to citizens what Build One South Africa is, what we stand for. And like any other, we've got to go through the process of making sure citizens know how to vote. But I also want to say, we are sitting within a global platform where we've seen significant changes politically. Whether you think Emmanuel Macron is doing a good job or not, his election was a success. Whether uh, fellow, uh, South Afri fellow African, Hakiende Ichilema, in Zambia, who I worked with and have huge respect of, he came in and showed that change is possible. In Lesotho, we've just had elections now with Sam Matakaza. They are showing that change is possible. And I'm here to tell you, that in this country, we will bring the change. And I am working hard, day in, day out, with BOSA activists, with incredible leaders who are fresh in the political space, working in their communities to bring about that change here in South Africa. And so in 2024, I really believe we will be the force to be reckoned with and will deliver a double-digit growth. Many people remember your role in calling out corruption, particularly the intersection of private interests with public interests sure. around the Bosasa question. And of course, that's important work to be done. Do you have any business interests? Are you still involved in your business interests or have you renounced those now that you've started the political party? No, um, when I finished in 2019, you'll remember that at the time, out of principle, I stepped because I've never wanted to be a career politician. So I needed to work an income for my family legitimately. So I got involved in business, not only for that purpose, but also for the purpose of understanding how business works. And we've set up uh, funds that are able to empower micro enterprises because I truly believe the future of this country is empowering SMMEs. 
So my business interests have been such that it's given me the experience, the learnings, so that when we come into government, we're able to expand those at a national level in order to deliver this vision of a job in every home. So, so you, you haven't I'm never steered. You so haven't I haven't renounced, renounced them those interests. because I don't earn a cent from Build One South Africa. But don't you think there could be a conflict of being a political leader who's pursuing a broader political agenda while still being involved in private enterprise and having private interests? The fundamentals of parliamentary democracy come from the fact that you do not want careerists in politics. You wanted people who actually had made it in business, had done other things, and then coming into a parliamentary space to be able to create legislation that enables economic growth. So I don't see it as a negative. I actually see it as a strong positive that you've got a, fi a financial and a business base that allows you the latitude to, when coming into parliament, to step away from all of those interests, legitimately so, communicate to citizens, that now this is the focus that I've got, to, I've got to put all energy into. If you were to go to parliament again, would you renounce those business interests as you did before when you were in the DA? Because you say you started them because you left uh, paid politics. Oh, uh, before I even went into the DA, I was a leader in a church, right? And stepped down from that role. So this is not an abnormal transition, as it were. I come in now with a lot more experience, both having served in civic society, behind the pulpit, in business, in politics. And so I do think I come equipped with a vast array of skills. I also have been involved in academia, you know, been worked in a classroom as, a, uh, as an educator, have done my own uh, master's programs and finishing a PhD right now as we speak. So the, the work that I'm doing is so that you have the best arsenal of tools to be able to offer the best caliber of leadership no, you can bring to the country. Absolutely. I think there's no doubt, and I'm not saying business experience is not important, yeah. um, but I think there's a difference between, say, working in academia and having private personal interests, especially when you've called out the president, for example, on the way that his conflicts of private and public interest came to bear very forcefully and, and strongly. It's not exactly the same thing, but, but what I'm saying is, to lead a political party at the same time as being involved in businesses may involve the, 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 certain the, difficult conflicts that are best left just no, no, no. Just I, left I, th on the I side. think I must correct that view because the conflict isn't being in business. The conflict is when you use your business to amass state resources privately. That's the conflict. That's what corruption effectively is. It's, it's, it's the patronage network of the state. Is when you have a type of even palapala -pala situation or you have, as President Zuma demonstrated, using your public office to be able to self-benefit. None of the businesses I've been involved with as we sit here today are actually doing business with the state for that matter. In fact, we're doing the work of empowering micro-enterprises going forward. If you come into government, the issue with being able to say to citizens, here are my business interests, so that you know them, we are now divorcing ourselves away from them. And you can be assured, Sizwe, as I called out President Zuma, I'll be the first one to stand up with the integrity of being able to go. None of those respective businesses will in fact gain from public funds for their, for their own use. It cannot be. And so that's the conflict. I think, I think we, mustn't, we mustn't link every business South African to the idea that there are corrupt means that deal that, that, that you are going to derive from the state. And lastly, I think whilst we started the fight against corruption, we didn't finish it. 2024, I'm telling you when we come in here, those who have looted from the people of this country must be locked up. That principle must stand. And because they've destroyed the future of this country and we cannot shy away from that. Just because we had a Zondo commission or this commission or that is not enough until we see those who stole end up paying for the crimes they've committed. So you can reassure South Africans now that none of those interests are in conflict at the moment and Not none of those interests link with anything to do with the state. Completely, because it's, it's, it's a principle I've always upheld and even, uh, even so will always upheld, uh, uh, stand up for it because I think it's important for this country. Thanks for... Watching us on Unfiltered, our conversation with Musi Maimane continues after the break. Stick with us.
Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're in conversation with Musi Maimane. Remember to use the hashtag Maimane on Unfiltered on social media. Mr. Maimane, let's come to the question of foreign policy, because mm. if you are going to be the president of South Africa, as we mentioned in the previous segment, then you would be in charge of South Africa's foreign policy. And yeah. it's, it's key and crucial that we, we understand where you stand on, on some of those questions. You've been very forthright in your views on the Russia-Ukraine situation. You've said that we should be activist on the question of Russia. You've said that the ANC is destroying our relationship with Western trading partners. Mm. Are you too pro-Western in your foreign policy? Let, let me put this first caveat. One, we, when we started the show, I said I, I, my values are of Ubuntu, that we share common humanity. We also share threats, common threats. That's Ubuntu. I am very pro-Africa because that's an important issue because emanating from this issue, the choice is not West or East. The choice, in my view, must be how do we strengthen our own intercontinental trade so as to achieve, if you like, a multipolar universe. Now to the question of Russia, Ukraine, emanating from values. If you value a country's sovereignty, and South Africa is a sovereign state, I think it's an unprovoked war that President Putin is putting on the table. Therefore, we need to stand strong as people who believe in sovereignty of countries that you simply can't have that occurring. And furthermore to this issue, as South Africa, when you look at our interests emanating from our values and the idea of trade, there can be no doubt that our ambiguous stance, because it's ambiguous, people say when we're neutral and then actually we are pro-Russia, is having economic consequences. So if I'm a loyalist to the people of this country, my foreign policy cannot put our citizens in jeopardy. And the jeopardy is already occurring. We have a devaluing, devaluing currency. Furthermore, we're losing jobs. And ultimately, if you then have to be pragmatic about the decision, Russia's investment in the country relative to the, to the global West in terms of its own investment, this is chalk and cheese. Can, can, I, can I take you up on that? Because isn't the appropriate stance actually the one that's been adopted? Maybe not in uh, form, but in substance, that we should neither aggravate relations with Russia, China, countries like India and our BRICS partners, mm. nor should we aggravate our relations with the West. And we should be trying to tread that balance rather than taking a, an extreme stance on one or the other. So, so isn't South Africa actually in a very difficult position? Because quite frankly, if we do strain relations with Russia or with China or with other global southern partners, that also has geopolitical and economic consequences. Isn't, isn't non-alignment properly practiced actually the, the strategic position? Well, I happen to think that we are not not aligned. Neutrality in the face of injustice is in fact siding with the aggressor. That's common cause. So we could not afford to do that. I would have hated for many in the face of apartheid to say we want to remain neutral. Because that was an injustice. And I hold the view that what is happening in Russia, Ukraine is an injustice. Condemning it and being able to stand firm on your principle doesn't in and of itself mean that you malign or you distance yourself from countries like China or countries like India or the West. You are ensuring that your principles are upheld and furthermore, in the real politique of foreign policy, that you create common interests with countries who share your views. Because my, my difficulty about this situation is that our alignment is actually not even with modern day Russia. Often much of it is legitimized on the basis of our historical ties to the Soviet Union. And I hear it even on this show when people come here, they say, but we align with Russia on this. 
The problem with that stance, if you simply say, we'll always have permanent friends, your difficulty with that is that you are also aligned on a different example with parties like ZANU-PF. And none of us can deny the fact that there are injustices taking place in Zimbabwe today that South Africa ought to be condemning right next door, and we are failing to do so. No, there's no doubt about that, and I did challenge those views that came from the opposite side of the, of the political spectrum on Russia-Ukraine. But... China is actually our biggest trading partner. Yes. When we look at our exports, China, the United uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in terms of our oil exports, India account for 30, 30 billion, whereas the UK and the US combined account for just 13 billion. So there is actually, a, if we're talking rands and cents, there is a shift in our own geopolitical and geoeconomic relations that have to take account of countries like China who aren't necessarily aligned to the US and the West on Russia, Ukraine. So there could be economic consequences of actually going too far to the pro-Western position. And, and then what happens if China get, takes umbrage at that? And we know they've taken umbrage at things like the Dalai Lama coming to South Africa. So there could be serious economic consequences of a very pro-Western foreign policy too. And, and, and I do think that's why you look at your trade interests uniquely on the issue of Russia. Russia's investment in this country is low. And so for us- So is Ukraine. To, to look at the, the issue that uh, even our voting record at the UN Security Council, we've become a in a club of countries that some of them don't even practice democracy, etc. That's why when I opened this conversation, it's not just picking West or this. It's also about given the fact that we are in this continent, our long-term trajectory in foreign policy, which is a conversation we don't have, is how do we strengthen our intra-African trade? We've got 1.2 billion people who will be in this continent by 2040. Is it possible for us to answer this question? In the same way as China was seeing population growth and had to modernize and had to build their economic a space, can we as South Africa lead that process here in Africa and become ourselves another power that can be spoken about? Why is there a lack of vision around Africa and we almost feel as though we should be these bread basket, this, this begging bowl that simply now has to choose between West or whatever? So we've got to focus on that intra-trade. We've got to ensure that our trade allies, because you can't deny Contrary to what China does in terms of opening its own market to us, it's easy for Chinese products to come into the country. Opening up our own exports to China is a different, is a different exercise. We've shown that even through Agoa, and not saying that you are picking the West, our export markets into those places have been significant. So we've got to look at the basket of trade allies, strengthen our trade position, and ensure that we maximize what benefits citizens. And then furthermore, continue this journey of strengthening our Africa ties. That is the basis of my foreign policy. No, I take your point on intra-African trade, and I think that's something that across the political spectrum and outside of politics, many people are, are keen to, to forward. On trade, though, I think China is still our biggest export market at the moment at, at 20 billion. And so even in terms of exports, China, we, we can't ignore in terms of our foreign policy. And, and, and I'm not calling for it's ignoring. But, Why? But, but, yeah. The thing is that Ukraine and Russia, the Ukraine-Russia question bears on our relationship with China because of China's relationship with Russia, just like the US's relationship with, with NATO bears on our relationship. So we can't exclude China when we talk about Russia-Ukraine either, just like we can't exclude the West. And, and that's why I think thinking, thinking through the question of our foreign policy is actually not as clear cut as just we should have a pure pro-Western position. And no one is advancing that position. That well, you've says been, one must just you've be been pro, quite pro. I'm simply saying, as it pertains to the injustice. So let's talk. So, 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 so because if, if we sit here and then say to ourselves, oh, fine, because we've got these relations here and that, mm. it's okay for people to break laws. But there are injustices in many places in the world. And we should be at the forefront of ensuring that we stand up for principle. Let's talk about one of them. The International Criminal Court, in addition to having very hard-hitting things to say about Russia, mm. has also uh, opened an investigation into 
Israel and the situation in Palestine. Mm. This is something that many people also believe mm. is an injustice. Do you, do you believe that South Africa should intervene in that injustice, as you've just so passionately Correct. stated? Yeah, and, and, and certainly an injustice here uh, does not simply, simply delegitimize an injustice elsewhere. Injustice is injustice. I've always stood for principle. And on the Israel-Palestine issue, I've always maintained that as uh, I agree that a two-state solution must always be on the table. I have been to both sides of the argument, both Palestine and Israel. And ultimately, both countries are interested in settling a two-state solution. We must support that as the international community. Where there are illegalities, whether there are illegal settlements or unprovoked attacks, they must be condemned likewise. I don't understand why a, a, when you stand up for justice, it's a nullification of other issues. You can be principled, but also be able to stand up for the fact that you've got trade interests, etc., etc. So to me, I don't think those two things are opposite polars of each other. It's the very nature of foreign policy. And as a leader, You've got to recognize the fact that when you lead a nation, someone once so wisely reminded me that in foreign policy, sometimes it isn't a choice between good and bad or X versus Y. It's sometimes between worse and much worse. So you've got to exercise the judgment as a leader to be able to do so. But I also want to re-emphasize this issue. And I'm glad we're having a conversation here about foreign policy, but we must also not have it in isolation to South Africa's interests. Because as rules stand at the moment, we've got to recognize the fact that if I was sourcing for energy or energy supply, I'd have to think hard about where I'd procure that. If I'm looking for patents on vaccines, I have to think hard about where those are coming from. And both those choices involve me in certain instances having to deal with Western countries and in other choices having to deal with China and many others. So the South African citizen, who is standing up for the fight of the people of this country? That's my fight. Stick with us on Unfiltered. This is the place where we have the deepest debates about the issues that matter in South Africa. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're in conversation with Musi Maimane, the leader of Build One South Africa. Can we turn to more domestic questions? Let's, let's yeah. bring ourselves down from high <laughs> geopolitics. You've been a fervent advocate for electoral reform. Mm. But it seems like now we're kind of entering the worst of both worlds because we've had this fight about electoral reform. But on the other hand, the current political establishment has pushed back against that. And now it looks like for 2024, we're going to have this hybrid Frankenstein of an electoral system that suits no one. To what extent do you take blame for that in that... Now citizens have neither the old system nor a better new system, but just something in between. No, I, the fight must continue. When I fought for this issue, we, we, are, we are making continuous steps. We went to the Constitutional Court and said, amend the law. People make this mistake. They say, all I just wanted was independence. No, I actually want a constituency-based model. So in 2024, you'd be assured when BOSA is in parliament, we want to bring a constituency-based model. Why the user for the voter is that we've got politicians who are not accountable. Today, we're here in Johannesburg. Uh, Charlotte McClake, is a, the hospital is dysfunctional. Who is the person who's meant to go in there and be held accountable? So I will continue to fight. Whilst the electoral amendment bill going into next year isn't what it is, Citizens need to vote for BOSA so that we can make sure we get more MPs into the issue so that we can continue to fight. We are practicing it. How I've recruited candidates, they represent their communities because that remains my fight. But can I ask you on constituencies? Because there's an assumption that a constituency-based system would actually be preferable. But constituency-based systems themselves also have their own problems. And one of them, for example, is that the link between the proportionality in parliament mm. and the election that happens actually diminishes. And in a country like South Africa with many different races, religions and creeds, don't we want the most proportional representation possible? Why would we reduce that simply in favor of a constituency no, system? I, no one is, is eradicating proportionality. The constitution actually is built on that. But you're advancing so, a constituency, so, a more constituency purely. system. I'm, I'm, we don't have none at the moment, yet in practice, 
we allocate funds for constituencies. So to your point, we've had neither the best. Uh, members of parliament had given weeks off on the weekend or even school holidays to go spend time in constituency period. South Africans are not benefiting at all. But what so, if that so happens my fight with the constituency is, system? That, exactly. Maybe that's exactly what will happen once we build constituencies. No, no, not at all. M MPs will just go to parliament, pretend to be in their constituencies, no, no, but no, still no, no. stay out of them. I want 200, that happens all around the world. If we get 200, 200, we get a mixed system. Secondly, I want MPs to be in their constituency so that people can ask them questions about what is going on in their communities. Thirdly, when you have a constituency-based system, it means when you take your oath in parliament, you say, I'll defend the constitution, you know you must do that. Rather than defending the constitution of the party, you'll defend the constitution of the republic. Imagine on Palapal. If you had MPs who had a constituency base knowing their mandate is given by the people rather than just simply the party, how would we have voted on the report? But in Do we not need an investigation into that that would free people the right to say, I'm not loyal to the party first, I'm loyal to the people? But, but are, you, are we not glamorizing just all of a sudden you have a constituency and then suddenly accountability flows? There are many countries in the world with constituency systems, the United States being one. Uh, the United Kingdom being another. Correct. That doesn't solve the problem of, of corruption. In fact, there have been, been you... corruption scandals in, in those countries since time immemorial. Where... Once we create a constituency system, I suspect the problem is not necessarily the system, it's the bad faith politics within that system, which will always find a way around the system. And, well... and, and assuming the system will change the bad faith politics is putting the cart before the horse. I think you are disproving your theory. I don't have theories, well, the just UK, questions. The UK system, in many ways, was not perfect. But if a prime minister holds a party, illegally breaks regulation, he's now the former prime minister. When Liz Trust came in there and actually re nearly destroyed their economy, she's now out. But we don't, so want, the truth we, is, we don't want a different president every, no, no, every no, no, minute. No, no. We that, want that was an a bad accountable thing. president. That was a, a bad thing. That we that want happened. an accountable president in the sense that you break the law, you are unfit to be the president. But we, and we what we don't have, have at the moment... We already have those laws. We've got the no, acts no, 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 no. against corruption. We've got the constitution. We've, the, the problem apex is not of the accountability laws. is still parliament. In that two clauses in the constitution, section 89 and section 102, give you the right to vote out the president. In a party-based system, I know it. You asked ANC MPs to come to parliament to tell us that a, a, a swimming pool is a fire pool. And they voted to say that. Hey, look, so that's I, the point. I, I'm not defending that. But so what, what I am, I'm trying to get what at I'm, is... What I'm saying is, aren't you, aren't you putting too much premium on the system design when in actual fact it's the political culture? No matter what the design is, if the political culture remains toxic, the design won't change anything. And, and, and actually, there may be some problems with the design. Yeah. Another one of them being... What happens to all those constituency votes that, that don't, get, sure. don't get counted? And Suddenly, under the current system, those votes would lead to the representation in parliament. But under the new system that you're proposing, those votes actually wouldn't have the, the muscle and the might that they currently do. No, it, as, as things stand at the moment, we've got a form of that even at local government and ward councillors know they must work for their constituencies. So, 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 so the reality of it is that South Africa is an anomaly in Africa because in actual fact, when you look at even, even this conversation we're having about coalitions, coalitions would be best solved by amending the electoral act so that you've got a constituency based model. Why that is, is that then and only then can you create pre-coalition conditions where you can be able to say this party is stronger there, you will coalesce with them, they can focus on that. The point is, and this is whatever the system is, we have two problems in this country. We have a dysfunctional parliament born out of the fact that it favors party rather than people. And the second is we've got unaccountable public representatives who at the end of the day stop representing the public. But is your proposal so, so to my get proposal, rid of parties? Because it seems no, no, to me no, no, that no. the proposal is, retains parties. Even if you have parties, my insistence is that actually those members of parliament must represent the people in their community. So let me tell you a bit about what BOSA is doing to this effect. When I say we've got a 10-point a plan, 
I then empower that person to say, you must go into the community and show people how you're going to fix education, how you're going to solve crime. How... Imagine if we had an MP who was as concerned about the schools just in their constituency. So suddenly, when they go to parliament to vote for budgets and we're fighting for a voucher system so that kids can actually have a choice as to where they want to go, suddenly that MP has carries a mandate that comes from the people. But that's technically already what should be happening with our local government system, which you just alluded to. But when you look at where governance is the worst in the country, it's probably in the local government system, even though we ha already have that kind of hybrid system. So wouldn't we just get what we got at local no, government it's, now it's the worst at the national level? Because we've we've given too much power to parties. And those parties do not respect the people anymore. You see, whilst local government falters, why does it falter? It falters because you've got, you know, it, the institutions have been captured, not because of how we elect in that local government, the institutions have been captured. And the accountability, in this instance for the parties, has failed because they suddenly deploy their own people, they capture the institutions, and therefore you fail. So what I'm trying to do is free that up so that you don't achieve state capture. The enemy that we've seen at local government is local government capture, and we've, got to, we've, we've fought against it at national government, but if we keep the system as we have it now, we will have state capture on steroids. That's what we're seeing now. But what if the national institutions which are already captured just stay captured? Then changing the system by we'll that logic, by that logic suddenly, it would just be like... It is at the local level. No, now suddenly, if you want to elect a public protector, you don't just deploy at, at an office somewhere and say, go to parliament and vote. There were people that told me in the disbanding of the Scorpions, it was a decision that was taken at Lutuli House. They sent the people there, so don't think about it, just go vote to remove the Scorpions. Suddenly you free up the ability for people to actually reason for citizens. But what if the party just says, yes, you got voted by a constituency, but you must still vote for the bill? The party is still going to exert some power. People are going to want to climb up the party ranks. Those incentives are still there. They, they're still there, but now citizens have the power. In the bill that we've put forward, this is the power I want to give citizens at home. You don't like what your MP is doing, you can recall them. And if it means that this person is corrupt, no longer serving your interests, move them out. My long-term objective, I, I will not hide it, I want a direct election of the president in this country so that people have a choice, so that we're not sitting here watching Nazareth going, oh, they are voting in Nazareth, that must be the president, or they are voting at federal council or whatever. Let's, let's, let's leave directly it there. vote let's for the come president. Back, let's come back to that because I think it's a very interesting and fascinating proposal. We're in conversation with Musi Maimane. We're having deep debates about the country and its future. Stay tuned to Unfiltered. Welcome back to Unfiltered. We're in conversation with Musi Maimane, the leader of Borsa. Before we get back into the conversation, let's take a look at what you've been saying on Twitter and have a look at some of your tweets. Kahiso says, Musi has built and destroyed Borsa in the Northwest province. I think him sitting there knows that Northwest is not part of Borsa national footprint he's referring to. As an individual, he's polling more than Borsa and I doubt if the party will enjoy electoral support come 2024. Matthew says, my mane never recovered from being removed and labeled a fail, quote, failed experiment. That should be in quotation are, marks. Voters? All these bossa preaching reek of desperation and little substance. Who's selecting these? He is a genuine, oh, wait, wait, just wait for this one. Before you, <laughs> he is a genuine and honest leader. Should we send that one back? <laughs> never been accused of corruption as he holds high moral standing. I believe in Musi's vision of building one SA. He did not fail at the DA. The DA is resistant to truthful transformation. How do you respond to some of the, the tweets, positive and negative, that have come Yeah, up? I mean, there's a lot of work that we're doing in the Northwest. Uh, and, you know, to tell you the truth, I went into the Northwest. We wanted to elect the best leadership. I still practice accountability. So if there are issues, we bring change. So when they say we built it, and we're continuing to build. In fact, I've got a team going to the Northwest to make sure we build it. There's a massive opportunity. And my issue there 
is that given what is going with a failed municipality, failed province, all the potholes there, lack of employment amongst youth, it's going to be important that we build a strong uh, team at the Northwest to continue the work. So that's what I'm focused on. So I think the tweet in some ways is we need to respond to that on, on the issue of it. And I love, I love it in truth. You know, since with something, something must remain true objectively in this country. And when we make a choice next year, and that's why I put myself as a choice. So if you find as elements in my life of corruption of any kind, then I will be the first one to take accountability as I did for anything else and will move away from the space. On the issue of vision, if you say to me, let's debate ideas, show me another leader who's coming up with ideas and says, here are my ideas, here's my ideas. Let's debate that. That's a much better contestation. And I've been consistent, even in my fight, not only about transformation in society and building one South Africa. This vision I hold is important because even when we look at something like education, it's an important dynamic. I, I think you made reference in your own book about the new apartheid. I think given that tomorrow is June 16, we mustn't lose track about how failed our education system has become and it's creating a situation where if you've got more money, you'll get a better education. You've got less money, you'll get less education. So that's a fact. Now I've got to fight to change that. That's why I keep contesting to make sure that we put a voucher system so that parents can choose and we can transform our education system. I want to make sure that our economy, you know, yesterday I was in Davidton uh, speaking to the communities in Etwatwa, the township economy and making sure that we can stimulate that and make sure SMMEs are empowered. That's what we've got to do. So it's not just integrity or all of that. It's also about the contestation of ideas and ideals and focused on how we drive this country forward. Now, how do I keep asking you tough questions when you cite my own book back to me? This is unfair now. <laughs> this is unfair. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's an no, important sure. argument you put. No, yeah. For sure. And, and, and I think the question of uh, race that has been central in many ways to the politics as, of South Africa through your trajectory yeah. into the highest levels of politics has, has been key both in the DA, now in, in Borsa. Mm. Where do you stand on this question of racial redress? Yeah, it's absolutely paramount. But racial redress is not a matter of one race versus another. That's sometimes what polarizing and populist politicians seek to do. Redress is a value that must be owned by all races that recognized that apartheid was an injustice committed against black South Africans. And I can see legitimately that there are white South Africans or who are committed to achieving redress. There are South Africans of all walks of life, black, white, Indian, and colored, working together to achieve that. So when I talk about building one South Africa, it's not a project for one race against another. It's a project for all South Africans to say, there's our economy deliver shared prosperity. When I talk about Ubuntu, remember we started with the value. It's a function of seeing the shared humanity that says the threats of load shedding, of crime, are shared by all of us. So we must be able to condemn murder, whether it's the murder of, a, of any race in this country. We must be quick to say where there's an injustice and many people, whether that the, the, the face of poverty, which largely remains black, it should insult all of us as South Africans to say, let's deal with that issue. And if the education is failing, let's deal with that issue collectively as a country, because together we will find solutions for one another in this country. In practical terms, yeah. there's a debate going on about the continued salience of black economic empowerment policies. There's a new amendment bill which is proposing more specific targets, even though there isn't much enforcement mm. even in the bill. Is that the kind of thing that you would continue or is that the kind of thing that you are seeking to move away from? It's, I've already put on the table a build one South Africa policy. And the reason I say let's focus on that because triple B double E is a construct of the ANC. We have a construct of build one South Africa that says how do we achieve redress, restitution in order to build this one South Africa. So of course, I'm advancing a vision that says, if your parents weren't able to get uh, access to university because of our historical laws, the state today must be able to help you do that. Let's create a national venture capital that makes sure that particular SMS, SMMEs that are black owned must be empowered to be able to participate in the economy. Let's deal with redress and do it properly so that we prosper together as a nation. So with the state, would the state intervene to resolve racial injustices named as racial injustices? 
Of course. Or would you use proxy measures no, like of income it has to. and and past university experiences? So, we have a so history you, in this country. So you're talking about the retention of 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 race as a redressive category in South Africa. You know, sometimes I worry that people, when you raise the question of race, they tend to make it synonymous with racism. When you say you raise race, you must be racist. No, it's not true. I actually think that uh, I see more citizens who look at this issue and they say, it cannot be when we talk about the many South Africans, there's also a South Africa that is largely black and infrastructure that doesn't work. That is a view that can be shared by all citizens. And therefore, identifying that we must attend to that issue is important. Because I, part of the reason I battle with what's going on in the DA now is that the notion of color blindness makes it racism blindness sometimes, and more seriously, makes it ahistorical and unjust on certain issues. Because then a township like Kailicha becomes not an apartheid spatial conception, it becomes just a township for poor people. We've got to be honest with ourselves and say we have a history that we've got to attend to so that me, being in a mixed race relationship with my kids, I want them to live in a country where if they go visit Gogo in Soweto, they must be able to get there and see prosperity happening as much as when they go see Granny in Florida, whatever the old, uh, old configurations are, they see prosperity. And so my destination, when I talk about build one policy on redress, I don't only focus on the economic issues. I also focus on this, on a national civilian service that will allow all citizens, particularly young people, to give a year's program so that we can share values, debate those issues. That's what helps us build a shared vision for this country across all racial lines. We have to achieve a vision for, for, for that future. Mr. Maimane, thank you so much for joining us and for fielding the tough questions. We appreciate your time. Always, it's a great privilege. I'll see you soon. We're going to take a look at the poll that was sent out on social media before we close off. Can Musi Maimane's leadership be trusted? Yes, 39, no, 60. Musi will ask where, where the votes came from. This is a rigged election. <laughs> Stop the count, we Stop. say. We say. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us again on Unfiltered. We inquired into some of Musi Maimane's views more deeply than perhaps has been done before and asked him some tough questions. Let's continue the conversation on social media. What were your thoughts on this installment of Unfiltered? We look forward to continuing that conversation there and make sure to stay tuned to Unfiltered News, Unfiltered Views and Unfiltered Conversations. Good evening.